about today on this um, uh, Munch and Learn is removing and replacing sealants. Some people call it cut out and recalk. Um, it sounds really simple, but uh, I don't think it is, and I think it's a, it's a great way to lose money. And most people that price it uh, price it incorrectly. So, um, and most people that do it do it incorrectly. So I'm going to go over um, some things uh, about cutting out and recalk and sealing, or replace and removing and replacing sealing. I'm going to talk about different types of joints. Uh, butt joints, bridge joints, band-aid joints, fillets and laps. I'm going to talk about a rain screen design on joint sealants, which is also referred to as double caulking. And then um, uh, I'm also going to uh, talk about different considerations for sealant removal, um, uh, whether it's hand tools or power tools. Um, and then uh, in, in that same vein, talk about how to prep that joint uh, to remove uh, to install a new sealant. Um, and then we'll talk about material selection, uh, different sizes and shapes, accessories, and uh, access as well. Okay. Um, one thing that uh, that's commonly overlooked with sealants, um, whether you're installing a new sealant or it's, uh, reinstalling a sealant, is um, what are you supposed to be doing? And there are standards. There's ASTM standards for uh, building sealants. Um, recently, I was contacted by an architect and said, "Hey, um, what size joint should I have, and what size sealant? What kind of sealant should I put in this joint?" I'm building a plaster wall. It's uh, going to be three stories tall, and gave me some uh, some guidelines on on what she was building. I said, "Listen, that's really not my deal." Um, Joint design and material selection is, is, is a design professional's uh, uh, job. I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you this, the ASTM specifications uh, for that. Now, um, I put them up here on the screen, ASTM C717, uh, which is uh, just uh, nomenclature and terminology. What is, a, what is a caulk? What is a sealant? What is an expansion joint? Because a lot of times, You'll be talking to a, uh, either a design professional, a building owner, or a contractor, and they don't understand the subtle differences between caulk, expansion joint, expansion joint cover. Um, so when they label the drawings, you look at it and go, I see that you have an expansion joint there, but you don't have a cover, a sealant, a filler. You don't have any there. So what exactly do you mean by caulk? What do you mean by sealant? What do you need, mean by expansion joint? Um, so uh, uh, ASDM C717 uh, covers that. Um, there's a specification for elastomeric joint sealants. What does that mean, elastomeric? That's not even a real word. Uh, I think if you looked it up in Webster's Dictionary, you wouldn't find it. Um, I didn't when I looked it up. But uh, ASDM C920 covers uh, the, the term elastomeric means stretchy. That's all it really means. So uh, there is an ASDM specification for that. A lot of times, uh, people will expect us to adhere to these specifications, yet they have no clue of what they contain. So they want you to comply with the specifications and with the standards, um, but they don't comply or know what they are themselves. Especially when you come to ASTM uh, uh, C1193, which is standard use for joint sealants, um, standard guide for calculating movement, and other effects when you're selecting a sealant. You have to design the size of the joint in order to select the proper sealant to go in that joint. And the calculations that allow for thermal and seismic movement are covered in ASTM C1472. And sometimes, like with this architect that asked me how big that joint should be, I we paid the 60 bucks, downloaded the uh, uh, ASTM uh, guideline and sent it to her and said, here, follow these guidelines to design your joint movement. And she, for the life of me, would not do it. She didn't want to do the homework to calculate the movement. Well, I don't know what color she's selecting because when you select a color like red or orange, you're going to have different thermal movement on a concrete or plaster wall or even metal, especially metal, than if it was uh, black or white. So the color of the building or the substrate, the size of the joint, the type of material, the part of the country, the sun exposure, the height of the building, all those things come into play with the joint size. 
And, um, and then, of course, how to use the sealant selection guide. So when you use a silicone or a urethane or an acrylic or whatever, there's a selection process that's covered in ASTM C1299. Those things are not, um, that's not our, uh, our deal. Now, I can tell you this. Uh, standard guide for the use of joint sealants, ASTM C1193, that tells us how to install it, clean it, prime it, put the proper backing in. 1193 is our responsibility. And what we have done is melt some of those things down into manufacturer's printed guidelines that comply with those so that we are in general compliance with ASTM C1193. If you follow your training, your instructions, and the manufacturer's guidelines on how to install that sealant. But if you wanted to read through it and find out why you put the back of rot in, uh, when it's compressed 50%, um, uh, and what that allows you to do, there's there's a lot of thought that goes into those um, ASTM guidelines. But I can tell you that most of the design and construction personnel that do the related work um, don't do their homework and know what these things mean. Um, so here's the different types of joints, and the reason why these are so important, and the reason why I'm going over some of this basic stuff. It's most of the time when you do a cutout and recalk, you're fixing something that didn't work. So why didn't it work? And most of the time, you're installing something again that was, if it didn't work, it was probably design faulty to begin with. So you're putting a new sealant in, uh, in an old joint that was not, didn't, didn't have enough movement. So you kind of need to do those things, especially if you're removing and replacing a lot of sealant that's very difficult to access, like on a high rise. Um, you don't want to reinstall the sealants, recall the building, and find out they all fail again because you did the same thing that the initial contractor did. Uh, chances are they were installed poorly and incorrectly to begin with, so there's probably a lot of problems when you do a cutout and recall in a building. Um, it's not just one thing. They were designed wrong, they were selected wrong, they were installed wrong, they were maintained wrong. All those things is what you inherit when you do a cutout and recall job. So, uh, there's four basic joint types. One of them is a butt joint. You can see here where it's just uh, two substrates that come together. You're installing uh, sealant between the two, and the, the force on the sealant is uh, compression and ex extension, not so much shear. So you, you want a rubber band to stretch, and then you have to make sure that whatever sealant or rubber band you put in there stretches enough uh, to handle the movement in that joint. A Band-Aid or bridge joint, they're the same thing. It's like a Dow 1, 2, 3 joint, um, still span, uh, made by Pecora, and then um, I forget what Tremco's is made. It's a silicone strip that is connected on two sides by sealant, and, um, and typically it's pre-cured. It does not have to be pre-cured. It can be uh, placed with a special tool that I'll show you in a minute. So a, a bridge joint or band-aid joint is when you want to uh, uh, reestablish water tightness to a joint, you don't want to remove the old sealant or um, the joint is designed incorrectly and you need a wider joint. So uh, let's say on this picture here, let's say that that joint was uh, a quarter inch wide, they're all failing, and it really should be a half inch to three quarter inch joint. Well, you could put a one inch or an inch and a half band-aid joint over that, and you're going to get a lot more movement than you would if you just recall something that's a quarter inch wide. Now, a band-aid joint typically is bigger. Well, it is bigger, and it looks, uh, it's more noticeable on a building. You can blend it in if you select the right color, um, and if you select, select the right um, uh, texture. They can come textured like Eve's or they can come um, uh, smooth like aluminum or, or, uh, or metal pants. Um, so there's a way to put in these bridge joints. You put tape on each side uh, that you want the width of the joint, and then you install sealant uh, as an adhesive. You use the sealant as an adhesive. Bridge joints, there are people that make urethane bridge joints, but I don't recommend them, and neither does anybody else. But sometimes you cannot use silicone. Like you can't use silicone around food. FDA does not approve silicone for um, food storage or manufacturing of food products. So 
this year is, a, a, but the most common bridge joint or band-aid joint is a silicone joint because it's got the greatest amount of movement. And you could put a silicone down thinner than you could a urethane. A urethane, the minimum thickness is a quarter inch. The silicone, you can actually be at an eighth of an inch. So uh, this is a typical band-aid joint. Um, they're really useful in areas where you can't remove, let's say it's an east building. And if you remove the joint out of the eaves, you'll cut into the plaster and the reinforcement, I'm sorry, the, the uh, uh, styrofoam or the reinforcement. It's easier and better to go over the joint than it is to try to remove it. Sometimes putting a Band-Aid joint is cheaper than the removal uh, because the removal is so difficult. Uh, fillet joints are typically um, corner joints. Um, this is where you get into an issue where people talk about three-sided adhesion, or if you uh, caulk a corner joint, a fillet or a corner joint, you're fully adhered on both sides and it doesn't allow for movement. So um, typically people want to put a, a bond breaker or a, 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 some kind of um, bond prohibitive surface in the corner of a joint. Could be a small backer rod. It's easier said than done. Putting something uh, in the corner of a fillet joint so that the sealant doesn't stick. If you put a release tape, it's going to, it's, release tape is not very sticky. So trying to get it to conform to a corner before you put sealant over it. And then when you caulk and tool over it, sometimes you can dislodge the release tape. What we've done in the, in the past, uh, and when it's approved by an engineer, um, is we'll use a color crayon or a wax pencil or um, uh, a piece of keel, something to, uh, prevent the bond in the corner, and it's easier to control uh, a piece of wax or a color crayon to make it stick to that corner, and that, and that way you're scribing that into the corner, and you still leave a, a bond line of at least a quarter inch um, on each side of that corner. So uh, uh, this corner fillet joint is, uh, or fillet or fillet, whatever you want to call it, is, is basically bonded to two corners, and then you try to leave it not bonded in the, um, I mean, it's two sides, not the, and you and try to put a bond prohibitive uh, surface in the corner. Um, would you do that in a window too? You would use like a piece of wax if you were making. You could if you had two solid bond surfaces. Um, and, and we use that a lot around window perimeters because um, there's a couple reasons. There's a couple ways. Can I go back one? There's a couple ways you would uh, do this right. Here's what typically happens in a window. Number one, um, there's not enough room for a joint sealant. So you have to go on the face of the brick and you have to go on the face of the frame if, it, the, if the joint is too tight. The other thing they do is the window guy or the general contractor or the architect or the engineer or the owner don't want to pie the backer plate to the window frame. So the back of the window frame is hollow. And when you try to put your backer rod right in there, it just fills up the back of the frame. That is not, a, if you don't have a quarter inch of bite, mm -hmm. and, and like there's only an eighth inch fin or the thickness of a piece of sheet metal or aluminum, to put that backer rod in, it's certainly not enough room to grab a joint sealant. So a lot of windows that I see, the frames cannot accept the backer rod uh, in the right place, and the only way to make a proper joint sealant is to caulk on the face of the window frame. A lot of architects say, I don't care, I don't want to see the sealant on the frame, but there's not enough metal to adhere it in the joint, so you have to have them make a choice. But if you caulk the frame, you have to have that quarter inch bite, whether it's inside the backer uh, plate to the frame, or if the frame wraps around into the joint, or on the face of the frame itself. So I hope that answers your question. A lap joint is a joint that takes a lot of shear. Like we have a metal building here at headquarters, um, some of those laps are caulk and some are not. The problem is um, sealants don't always do that well in shear and, um, uh, and they tend to deform whatever they touch. So if you have a, uh, if you put a big goop of sealant and flat it out, screw two, lap, two pieces of metal together, uh, like on uh, roof cap flashing or on metal building seams, when that, when that metal heats up, it wants to tear that sealant apart. Now, if you just put a, a lap sealant over the top, it's going to want, it's going to shear it pretty easy. If you fill the, the lap, if you, if you butter the lap of that metal like one inch, it's going to want to move. If it sticks well enough, the metal will probably buckle. 
because that metal is going it's going to want to go somewhere. It's going to either want to rip the sealant and shear it, or it's going to want to um, uh, pop the screws out that hold down the metal, or it's going to want to bend the metal. So that's why on, on uh, most roof jobs you see, there's a band that allows for expansion on top of that. Those lap those lap splices uh, allow for movement. Now you could use a band-aid joint that gives a little bit more movement um, if you're going to cover over a lap sealant. But lap sealants are common. They're just uh, you got to understand there's a lot of shear uh, st uh, stress there, and they're not the best kind of a joint. They show a backer rod here, which allows some thickness um, to the joint sealant, but uh, most of the lap sealants are just buttered and slapped together, and, the, and they're minimal in, in thickness, a sixteenth of an inch or less. Um, this is a rain screen uh, detail. Uh, what you see on the left-hand side is, um, is a, uh, looking through, the, let's say this was a panel, a concrete panel joint. So what you have, uh, and, and the right side is looking down from the top part of the panel if it was two, uh, two concrete panels. What you do is you, um, you recess one joint about two inches in back. So you pack your backer rod about two inches back your first backer rod, and of course you would have to have a panel that's thick enough. You couldn't do it on a, a one inch thick panel or a piece of eaves because it's not thick enough. But let's say this was a six inch panel or a four inch panel. You would pack your backer rod about two inches deep. You would put a, a quarter inch to a half inch thick uh, sealant uh, at least an inch to an inch and a half back of the, of the face of the panel joint. And um, it doesn't have to look pretty, but it has to be technically correct. You have to have your backer rod. You have to have your sealant tooled and pressed to the corner so it adheres right. You have to have the right profile for the joint, half as deep as it is wide, um, no less than a quarter, no more than a half. And then uh, you have to tool that. The trick is you have to have a tool that you can put in that panel joint that goes back far enough. So if you have a panel joint that goes from a quarter inch to an inch, you know, what size tool can you fit in there? It's kind of a pain in the ass because you're back in that joint an inch and a half trying to tool it. So, um, and then uh, what you do is at the bottom of the panel joint or before an inner, so you're coming to where a vertical joint meets a horizontal joint, you take that back of your rod, bring it near the surface as you see on the left hand side. And what happens is if water, when you finish caulking the front and the back, the idea is that if the front joint fails, the back joint is your primary seal. So let's say that you did this in urethane, and after 10 years or 5 years, or if it's Tremco, a year and a half, your sealant fails, then your front sealant will fail, but your back sealant is not exposed to ultraviolet light, and uh, it will provide the waterproofing that you need, assuming that it's not moving too much and tearing that up. So it's called a rain screen or double caulk detail. The real bitch is in the um, connection at the bottom where you go from an uh, uh, intersection of vertical to horizontal uh, caulk joints. So there's some details. You can also uh, put a wheat tube in, in that on top of the, the back sealant and then caulk the, the uh, front sealant right over it. Uh, we did a project in um, Houston at the... Uh, Alkec uh, Cancer Research Center at MD Anderson. Um, and instead of leaving it open, we put a wheat tube in it and caulked around the wheat tube. But the, the configuration looked the same. Um, it's, uh, and, and another thing to be, uh, be careful of is, depending on what kind of sealant you're using, um, if it requires air to cure, you can't just caulk one and caulk the other. So that is a consideration, the curing mechanism on that sealant. This is typically done with um, silicone sealants. Anybody that's going to pay enough money to install a rain screen deal wants to do it once every 100 years. They want it done right, and the longest lasting uh, sealant that has the greatest movement capability is silicone. I've seen this done with urethane before, but it's kind of stupid. So then at the, at the top. Do you connect them both together? No. The one is always recessed. If you went over the top of the building, uh, let's say a top of the parapet, the other one would go up. It would still be recessed in the panel about two inches, inch and a half to two inches. Go across the panel, recess, 
and go back down the panel recess. The only time it comes to the surface is when it's going to weep out. So here's some joint, uh, joint prep considerations. Um, some are the same as with new sealants, um, but with recropping you have some uh, additional considerations. So with the urethane sealant, you're going out to, and we'll talk about how to tell the difference between the urethane and the silicone, but if you're going to, uh, in a minute, but if you're going to uh, replace a urethane sealant, you want to wonder why did it fail? How hard is it? Um, because sealant, sealant, uh, urethane sealants, if they're in there for 10 years, they can be as hard as a rock. And now a lot of, back in the old days, they were rock. They had a lot of stuff in them, uh, like the, the filler is dolomite, which is rock. It's, it's a hard product if it's mine, when it's mined. Um, so the fillers are hard. And once all the, um, the goodies are taken out of that, uh, ultraviolet light will beat up a sealant for a couple years, 10, 20, 30 years, 40 years. All that stuff gets harder and harder. Back in the day, window guys always felt, window guys and guys that work for Chamberlain, always felt the thicker the better. So you're going to remove a sealant that used to be rubbery, now it's hard as a rock, and it's an inch to two inches thick. Well, you're not going to remove that with a saw or a grinder. You're going to remove that with a chipping hammer. And you're going to screw up everything. It's going to be hard going. So you want to know um, how hard is the sealant, how deep is it, um, how difficult is the removal? Can you get it out without, uh, especially if it's a, a, a metal frame joint? Um, I have seen people try to fill up the frame with sealant, and then and then you go you do you go do a cutout recall. You go, man, I I can't get that I can't get that sealant out of the frame. Um, is there proper uh, uh, sub, uh, substrate and profile? So if you're going to remove and replace the sealant, and it was put in a crappy profile to begin with. Two things, uh, uh, well, a couple things are going to um, rear their ugly head. If it was a shitty profile, did they put a lot of sealant in there to try to make up for that profile and the lack of a bonding surface? Or did they just smear it all over the frame and the, and the brick and the concrete in order to make the sealant work? Which both of those take a, a bunch of effort to clean up. So most of the time, most of the cutout and recalk effort that you have is cleaning up old sealant not installing the new one. Um, so you have to know what you have, how much of it, and one sample, you might find out that they did a great job on the first floor, and by the time they get to the third floor, they put all the new guys up there, and it's just hammered crap. Um, of course, then you do have the saving grace, well, if it's on the third floor and uh, it's ugly, it might take a little extra effort. I mean, no one will see it as much when we finish, but that's not a good thing, because you still have to do it correctly. So is there proper substrate and profile? And it hasn't reverted. Uh, reversion uh, is, the, is the process of a sealant that used to be liquid. These sealants, most of them, unless they're pre-cured, are called liquid sealants. We install them as a liquid. When you mix them up, they cure into a solid. Urethanes, especially the old-style urethanes, in the presence of moisture um, or intense humidity and heat, can go back to being their liquid state. So you mix them up, they're either not mixed correctly, or they're designed poorly, or uh, they're in a saturated state, urethanes can turn back to a liquid. You'd like to know that before you have to dig it out. Um, uncured silicones can stay liquid for a long time too. And a poorly manufactured product or something out of shelf life can stay liquid and all kinds of stuff. So you want to know, um, especially with urethanes, has it reverted and gone back into goo? Because that's a lot of cleanup too. Um, on the silicone side, once again, why did it fail? How deep is it? It's hard to cut out really thick rubber. Um, so if they did, if they installed it too thick, which is incorrect, it's a bitch to get it out of there. And then you're having to scrape all that surface. Um, how difficult is the removal? Is there proper substrate um, and profile? And a big thing with silicones is how deep is the silicone migration? Silicones in their early years, and certainly still to this day have uh, what they call silicone migration or silicone oil migration. If you go to some of the buildings that were built in the 70s, 80s, and I don't think the 90s, I think they cured most of it by the 90s, you'll see a shadow around that sealant. And that, fat, that, that shadow is silicone oils that have migrated into the substrate. It happens a lot on granite buildings, on concrete buildings. 
obviously on not on, on non-porous sub, uh, substrates like glass and aluminum and metal, it, it, the migration is not as deep. But on a, a, a porous substrate like stone, brick, um, and uh, plaster, that silicone oil will migrate up to a quarter inch into that um, substrate. And nothing sticks to silicone after it's cured. So if you cut out that silicone and try to put a silicone back, or worse yet, never, ever cut out a silicone and put a urethane back, because it won't stick. So you're going to have to grind that substrate, that granite. You might start out with a quarter inch joint, and by the time you grind it back, that's a, that's a half inch joint, because you're having to get those silicone oils out. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a tough consideration. Have you seen Prosecco's picture of that seal, Josh? No. Where it has the bow ties in every piece of stone? No. I'll get it. I'll get it to you. It's a lot of migration. So you need to know how deep is the silicone migration. Are you going back with silicone? The answer would be yes. Uh, you might have an owner or architect or somebody else that wants you. I don't care what you put back in there, and somebody will put urethane. I've also seen people that are uneducated using urethane as a wet glazing product, and you can't wet glaze with urethane does not stick to glass. It doesn't stick to uh, non non porous substrates that well. It certainly doesn't stick to glass. Um, it, it might for a week or two. Um, so latex sealants again. Why did it fail? How hard is it? How deep is it? Um, how difficult is the removal? Same kind of stuff. And then what's the replacement sealant? Usually, if you're replacing a latex sealant, it's painter's caulk, it's butt joints and wood or siding or it's, uh, it's not a, a, I don't see it on the exterior of commercial s structures unless somebody fucked up and um, like somebody um, uh, did a crappy job. Other sealants, um, you have hybrids, which I have not cut out and recalled a hybrid job, but it's, I'm sure it's possible. That's a, that's a silo terminated polyether, a silo terminated polyurethane. Those are fairly new, but you will see polysulfide. Um, there's also some products from the 70s, uh, the 60s and 70s. Polysulfides before 1970 had PCB in them, and urethanes and polysulfides, and um, a couple other uh, products had asbestos and PCBs and, in them, and some have lead. Um, so you might have some, uh, some uh, fairly heavy contamination in some of those products. Um, so. Those other sealants you want to ask, how hard are they? Or find out how hard are they, how deep are they, how difficult is the removal, uh, is there a proper substrate and profile, how old is it? What happens on a lot of these cutout recalks is you'll see somebody skim over them time after time again. So you might have a latex, um, an asbestos-based product, uh, a polysulfide, a urethane, and silicone, all in that same joint. And, and you're, uh, you got some problems. That's, that's not an easy deal. Um, I've had friends that were doing work on projects that turned into hazardous waste operations because they found out there was PCBs on them. Um, they were cutting out and recalking a job in uh, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, up at um, one of the big colleges. And uh, I don't know if it was Harvard or if it was Boston College or what, but um, or maybe it was Cambridge. Um, but they. Uh, some of these old caulkers have been around a long time. As soon as they hit it with a grinder, they could smell the PCB oil burning in the in the sealant. They go, "Hey, this has got PCBs in it," because they've been around for so long. And uh, sure enough, it was hot, and so they had to tent the whole building and take off stone and do all kinds of stuff just because the sealant was contaminated. So um, when you get to these older buildings, you need to make sure that um, and, and and that's not really our job. What we need to do is qualify our our quotations when we bid these jobs and say, "Hey." Uh, this this does not include any cost for testing or remediating uh, sealants contaminated with regulated materials. So how do you tell the difference between those hybrids? Do they? I mean, does it burn kind of like a urethane does? Yeah, it's 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 a siliconized urethane or polyether is what it is. So somebody figured out how they can add silicone, and silicone is the best sealant material out there as far as performance. Um, so the urethane manufacturer said, hey, we can just add some silicone polymer to our uh, polyurethane. And now the silicone guys go, that's not really, that's not really silicone. And so anyway, it's a, it's a bullshit deal. It's a, you know, you, I, I've never cut one out. 
because they're fairly new. You don't see them in the market. You see them in the market coming into the market right now, but you don't see a, I haven't done a replacement job. Um, so uh, certainly uh, it's nice to do a, 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 a mock-up when you install a new sealant, but cut out the old sealant. Um, so do a pull test on the old sealant. What do you have in there? How thick is it? Because if you did a standard pull test, you cut down both sides and pull it out, you'd find out, wow, it's not even adhering on this one side, or it's it's not even thick enough on this one side, or, or gee, there's six different kinds of sealant in here. I have three different colors and six different layers, and they're all shit. All that somebody did was hammer them deep. Somebody cut them, pushed them back, and caulked over it, or in some places, they just caulk right over it. You go, oh, my God, and I'll show you some pictures of that. So you want to do a, a, a test, a sample of what's on the building, just like you would do a normal mock-up test. But you're looking for how thick is it, how deep is it, for more than performance of, of a new sealant. You want to look and say, what do I have to remove? Um, another thing that you can do, hey, Joey, I don't like this thing. Yeah, uh, for, uh, forward. One moment. There you go. I'll just point to you. Um, this is a joint movement indicator. Um, now this, you can use this on a new building or a, a, an old building. This is what you would, it's called a scratch gauge. You um, glue with an epoxy onto each side of the joint. This is a butt joint, a brick butt joint, maybe a block butt joint. And um, so right over the, the, uh, the joint opening, you put uh, this, uh, this happens to be a Dow Corning thing. What it is, it's, it's, it's two sides, it's three plates, two glued together, and one floating on top of the other with a screw in it. So you epoxy this to the side of the building or uh, over the side, over the joint. It could be on the floor as well. And then um, you take a, t a period of time. The last time I used this was in Albuquerque where these joints were failing. Uh, they were huge. And we put a big band-aid joint in it. They still failed. Between morning and night, the joint was moving like an inch. And that's from the top. And was, it was a one-inch joint. And uh, the way it was designed, these panels were just, they were bowing like a son of a bitch and was making these joints fail at the, at the building base. So we had to measure the joint movement um, of the panels. And so we put one of these gauges on and found out what happens is that screw that's going through that top plate um, scratches the uh, bronze analyzed, uh, bronze anodized aluminum on the bottom, and you could track to see the the, the movement. So let's say that this uh, movement gauge is on here, and there's shear. The joint goes up and down. It'll actually scratch um, across the plate um, vertically instead of horizontally. You go, wow, it's moving up and down. This this wall's going up, and this one's going down. So you can measure shear, but most of the time it measures uh, expansion and contraction. And the reason that might be important, let's say you go out and caulk a building, or let's say that uh, by your sample, you pulled out that sample and it looked like nothing's sticking. Why is this building 10 years old and been recalked three times? Maybe the sealant is being asked to do more than it should. Maybe that half inch joint is moving one inch, and there's no sealant that will cover that. So going back and recalking that, even if it was caulked wrong, doesn't mean um, uh, if it was caught right, it would work. It could be designed incorrectly. There's too few joints and they're too far apart. Um, there's too much movement in it because it's a metal panel and there's so much heat that goes off that, that, that metal panel. So you put this joint movement gauge on there, it'll tell you how much that building is cycling. You can leave it on there for six months. You can leave it on there six days. Whatever, um, normally, I, I don't know what they specify, but there's a, whole, there's a book that comes with this joint movement indicator that tells you um, how, to, how to apply that. So here's uh, the most common kind of failures are cohesive and adhesive. And um, uh, you can't always tell. Most people think because it splits in the middle, it's a cohesive failure. So the one on the left there, you see the sealant is still sticking on one side, and it's split in the middle. Is that a cohesive failure? Yes, it's a cohesive failure, but uh, there still might be some. And, and typically, that could be a design issue. But it could be too thick. Maybe the sealant split because it's too thick. Maybe it has three uh, 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 adhesion on the back side, and that's why it split. 
So just because you have a cohesive failure doesn't mean that uh, we cleaned the substrate and did a good job of installing it. Certainly if you have an adhesive failure, it's easier to say uh, we probably didn't clean the joint well enough, there's a contaminant on the joint face, it may be too thick, there may be three-sided adhesion, uh, there might be some other things. The only difference between the two types of adhesive failure is it tells you why, a little bit more about why it failed and where to look. Um, you know, was the cohesive failure on the left, does that mean it was prepped right? No, but they have some joint movement issues there. You can look and say that one inch joint opened up more than a quarter inch. It's probably beyond the capacity of that sealant. It looks like a sealant selection issue and, a, and, a, and maybe a design issue for the joint. So maybe a joint sealant wouldn't work in that application. You can tell instead of removing all that, if that was on, a gra on the ground, you might have a trip hazard. If, and, and then you would have to think about how do I support that, maybe use an M-seal, a pre-compressed foam filler that's thicker, um, but you wouldn't want to go back with a soft sealant that would take more movement because that a high heel uh, issue, somebody in high heels could go right through that and trip and break their neck. Um, if it was vertically on a wall, you might say, I'm going to put a Band-Aid joint on it or a, a bridge joint and uh, it'll take more movement. Here's a couple other things um, that are just plain shitty work. You can see where that joint on the left has been skim coated. You got two colors of sealant, and as it comes more and more out of the joint, they just smear more, uh, smear uh, more and more stuff on there. Um, on the uh, right, you have a poor, uh, poor joint profile. This is a, a, a scupper coming through a wall, and there's a joint between uh, sheet metal, and uh, somebody just figured, well, I'll just caulk it, even if it. There's no, no backer rod. There's not enough size. Um, it's not really designed for a joint sealant. It's just the rough edge of a piece of metal um, right next to some stone. So there's nothing to create the right profile for that sealant on that scupper. And then this is just a collection of crap. Um, this is a uh, um, aluminum roof cap. And that goes uh, next to uh, two glass curtain walls on a zipper gasket assembly. And so the zipper gasket, you can see on the left side at the corner of the zipper gasket, um, the gasket probably failed and they smeared some, some goo on it. And then the zipper gasket wall uh, changed dimensions uh, where it met the metal cap and somebody just smeared some sealant on that. Of course it failed and it looks like they might even put a urethane on top of a silicone because you see that the, on the right-hand side of the picture, uh, some of that stuff is, um, is deteriorated and uh, it's cracking and crazing. Uh, it looks like the silicone is maintaining its, its shape, although it's crazing and cracking a little bit. But you just can't keep smearing stuff on until it stops leaking. I guess you can, and they did. But when you go to replace this, um, it's, it's going to take a little more work. So here's how to test between um, uh, silicone and urethane. Um, silicone, when you try to light it on fire, uh, it turns white and smolders. Uh, urethane burns. It's a fuel. As a matter of fact, um, all the sealants that we have uh, when we clean our sealant buckets, all that solvent, um, we send that off to, uh, for secondary fuel. They burn it. Um, and you can, you can you know, think urethane burns like a like a tire. It'll, it'll keep burning forever. So um, you light it with a match and if it, if it uh, turns white and chalky and, and uh, snuffs out, it's, uh, it's a silicone. Um, you can probably tell by feeling it, but if you want to make sure, then, then light it on fire. If it burns, it's, it's probably a year. So uh, typically hand tools to remove sealant, you're going to have a, just a standard utility knife. You can use a, a, a pipe handle cutter. You can use a flat blade. Really, any, uh, any kind of um, blade, you want to make sure that it fits your hand. And um, uh, there's sealant when you're cutting it can grab from time to time. So you want to make sure that uh, people are wearing uh, the proper PPE, leather gloves, cut-resistant gloves. Uh, they should be two layers. You should have a cut-resistant glove underneath a leather glove. Because um, most of the substrates are um, um, either hot, like aluminum or glass. Mostly aluminum is pretty hot when you're... Uh, cutting out and recalking that. Um, and uh, if you're going against brick or precast, um, if you lose your grip or um, if your hand slides, you're going to hit that precast and lose some knuckles. So, um, uh, and, and it's 
it's not very comfortable on even a gloved hand if you have a cut resistant glove. So it's not a bad idea to use two layers of gloves. Um, the typical power tools for removing sealant, I like the ArborTech saw. Um, it has uh, blades that are made for caulk cutting. Um, you can see that online, the ArborTech 170. They're about 1200 bucks, uh, but they cut through sealant like butter. And it doesn't matter what kind it is. And let's say it's a harder sealant, it still works real good. The fine tool is a reciprocating blade that goes back and forth. I don't like it as much. It's not as safe. Um, it's lighter weight. Uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, it'll, it'll work. It depends on the surface uh, that you're working on. Uh, you also can use a sawzall. Um, that works real good as long as you're not up against a metal frame. Uh, a sawzall, you, you, once you puncture the joint, you just let the weight of the saw just drop right on down on top of it and it'll cut it out. Um, and of course, you have to grind up that residue, whether it's aluminum, I mean, whether it's uh, urethane or silicone, you have to take that sealant residue off the side. If you leave a thick residue on the side, because you're not cutting uh, enough of it off, if you leave a bunch of sealant in the joint, when you go to grind it, you'll burn it and just burn it into the substrate. So you want to remove as much of the sealant as you can with a blade, with a cutting blade, whether it's by hand or using one of these uh, Sawzall, a fine tool, or the ArborTech, so that when you put the grinder in there, you're not just cutting uh, uh, silicone or urethane and smearing it all over the place. You want to be, uh, you want to be uh, abrading the surface, not, uh, not removing the sealant. Um, so you would use a grinder on brick, uh, plaster, not eaves. Don't ever use a grinder on eaves because um, it's too thin. Uh, concrete, uh, but you would not use a grinder uh, unless there was a special case where you would use it on metal, and you certainly wouldn't use it on glass. So on porous substrates, a grinder on non-porous substrates, you would use a blade. Um, also, on, uh, you, would use a, you could use a wire brush after you grind it on uh, uh, porous sub substrates. On non-porous, You'll use the two-wipe method, just like you would if it was a new sealant. You'll wipe it with uh, xylene or toluene um, once to activate the dirty substrate, and then you would uh, pass by it again to remove all the dirt that you didn't remove with the first pass. So the two-wipe method with clean cotton rags, non-printed, no dyes, no nothing, clean white cotton rags, uh, two-wipe method to clean glass and aluminum or steel. So the most critical factor in the application of the sealant is um, clean, dry sound. That means free from contaminants. Um, I'm not a big fan of blowing stuff out. Um, I think you uh, use solvent wipe or use a mechanical method. So here's a butt, um, butt joint metal to metal. It actually is a yeah butt joint metal to metal uh, uh, condition. Um, the sealant is still goopy. It's a silicone sealant. Um, several layers of it. Uh, this is a rotunda job. It's uh, metal panels uh, with, with uh, it's all aluminum. Um, so we had to cut it out. We had to uh, scrape it and then um, clean it with uh, xylene uh, before we install the sealant. Um, certainly that's where we would use uh, a little bit more aggressive than just too white. I don't, uh, we couldn't remove uh, the rotunda uh, sealant material with two wipe, it was too thick and too gooey. So there was quite a bit of cleaning. Um, and I think they used a, a, a soft um, pad uh, with that solvent too to remove it. Kind of like a 3M pad, but not a 3M pad. Yeah, it's not an SOS, but it was uh... an abrasive pad. Yeah. Uh, but it had to be abra uh, not, not so abrasive that we damaged the finish of the metal too. Um, on the other side, uh, that's on the, on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, um, we have a couple joints here. Those panels, although they look smooth like metal, they're actually uh, cast in. So those were um, removed and ground um, to remove the silicone oils. Um, and then uh, we ground the sealant between the metal uh, window frame and the cast stone. And then um, after we cut out, and then 
we uh, saw that wipes, what we did, these windows, that's a, a completed wet glaze window on the right. So we cut off the rubber gaskets, solvent wiped between the glass and the aluminum frame, and installed the sealant to replace the gasket. Um, some folks can do three, four hundred feet a day of that. We cannot. And um, I'll show you why in a minute. And then the metal to metal connections were done as a bridge joint, which I'll show you in a minute. You can see at the heads of the windows where the millions meet the, the, the top rail of the window, um, there's that little bump out. That is actually a joint sealant done with a special tool. And here you see a close-up. Uh, they're a different window, but on the left-hand side, you see the gasket that's between the green frame and the glass. So what you do is take a utility knife and trim off that gasket. Now you have to make, you have to, this is done per uh, the engineer on the job. Um, he dictated the way that this was done. We cut that off and then we installed sealant, uh, a black Dow 795 that sticks to glass and aluminum. Fantastic. Uh, so we caulked it between uh, there and made, um, we brought the sealant out on the frame more because it was easier to do and it gave it a better look. It's very difficult to take a preformed gasket made in a factory and caulk and make it look like that. It's very difficult to wet glaze and make it look like that too. We had a lot of stuff that looked like hammered shit. And we had to, re you know, it took guys a couple weeks to figure out how to get it to look right. So that is a, um, um, a wet glazed uh, application right there. Also, uh, notice on the bottom right hand side, we have these uh, weeps on the bottom. A lot of times windows will, will uh, have a weep system. This here, that weep is too big for that window. Was it too big or too small? I can't remember. There's a certain size that you have to have for that weep. If it's too small, the surface <coughs> tension of the water will not allow the water to uh, out that weep. And if it's too big, it'll let water in. So we ended up putting baffles, pieces of sponge in that, in that frame so that water would not go back in it. Now here's uh, custom tools for bridge joints. This rotunda job had like 20 different custom tools. And so we had to take uh, plastic spatulas and cut them so that they would uh, uh, form a certain shape depending on what it is. Um, now, you can see the custom tool used on the left hand side. We put tape on both sides of the joint, on each side of the joint, um, uh, put a sealant over the top of it, and then tool it with this custom tool, and then you remove the tape. And what you're left with is a, is a, a bridge joint. So here's some of the standard things. You're going to use standard backing materials most of the time. Um, I, I think it won't be long before we don't even see close, uh, b before we don't see open cell back around anymore. Um, because most of the sealant manufacturers now, even the silicone guys, mm -hmm. say, yeah, you can use closed cell and you can use bicellular. Now, closed cell still does leave an outgassing problem, but um, soft cell does not. In open cell, a lot of architects and engineers say, I don't want it on my job. <coughs> So uh, there are some of your accessories. Um, access is a key um, consideration when looking at cutout recall. How do you get to the work? Because most of the time, if it's, a, if it's a problem, it's probably a leak. And if it's a roof, then the roofer's got it. If it's not the roof, it's probably going to be on the outside of the building. And that's, you can't walk up and caulk everything from, uh, from the outside. So swing stage is a, uh, one of the best ways to uh, access it, you can use a boom lift. It's a little more expensive, um, and, and you'll have to take up more property around the building, plus you can ruin stuff on the, around the building. Um, so boom lift is not always what it's cracked up to be. And then there's, of course, the one-man descent unit, which is Sky Genie. You can also get a motorized chair that uh, uh, is a one-man descent and ascent unit. So you run a cable, outriggers, it's just like a swing stage, but it's only for one person. Um, another way to access this building would be um, a crane and a basket. OSHA says you can use a crane and a basket for access when there's no other means of accessing the building. You can take a basket, lift it up at a crane. <coughs> Real expensive, but we've done it before um, two or three times. Um, there's, there's, there's generally a better way. And of course, you can use built-up scaffold. I think it's pretty pricey. So um, 
some of the access issues are where do you put your weights and your counterweights and your tiebacks? Uh, do you have anchors on the roof and are those anchors certified? <coughs> Who put those anchors in? Do you really want your guys hanging off them if they're not certified? It usually costs about 1500 bucks to get them certified. Um, we're looking at a couple jobs right now where they have, uh, when they give us the specifications to bid the job, they say, oh, by the way, here's the roof anchor certificates. And um, we ask for them before we'll go on a job. Where's the, where's the roof anchor certificates? Um, that's uh, another reason why we work with Spider so closely. Um, Big City Access will rent you stuff, and there's a bunch of other firms that will rent you stuff. Uh, they are not always looking out for your safety. They think that you might have all this experience. But we have a lot of experience doing high-rise work. But I certainly don't mind the oversight, don't mind paying for the oversight to have somebody that sets up a scaffold, a swing stage every day. Our guy might have been on a boom lift for the last three years. Now he's up on a swing stage again. He goes, hey, this is awesome. I get to be up on a swing stage. Um, but he might have forgot some things, like um, how to do his tiebacks. Um, may, maybe he didn't check to see if the anchors were certified. Maybe he didn't put enough weight on that beam. Maybe the beam wasn't connected. I've had guys go off and not have their safety rope. It's like, what are you doing? And it's a brain fart. So I would rather have Spider, somebody come out there and check it. We have them do the initial setup. Uh, we don't own our own staging equipment for that reason. I mean, I want it calibrated. I want it inspected. I want it maintained by people that do that every day, not just intermittently. Um, so uh, this project here, you see there's enough room to get around the perimeter uh, on the left. On the right, uh, there's no roof anchors there. How do you access that? we got to go up and clean that stain on top of that barrel vault there. It's like, so how do you tie off? And those issues are um, significant. So usually you can figure them out, but you have to ask the questions, how do we do it? How do we do it safely? Um, a lot of guys won't do it safely. Hey, I'm only going to be up there for a minute. But uh, on a big swing stage job, it's, it's, it's really important. So another thing to remember when you do cutout and recalk work is um, everybody wants to get the work done. I'd like to get the building to stop leaking. Hey, we're going to coat it. Uh, we've rented all these places. Uh, usually when you restore the ex exterior uh, integrity of a building envelope, um, uh, everybody has a great idea on how things are supposed to work. Well, um, some sealants don't work at all. And we're doing our own testing of sealants and finding out all these sealants here were, um, were uh, these samples were all constructed on the same day by an independent lab. Now, if you look at the third row from the bottom, the second and third sealant over from the left, you'll see that they've already failed. These sealants are less than a year. Some are primed, some are not. They're installed per manufacturer's recommendations, and they have only gone through compression. They have not gone through extension. So these things failed in their first cycle. And, um, and there's other ones that are failing too. So. Um, it's interesting when you go back and, and reinstall a sealant and someone says, hey, I want to use uh, Tremco Dimeric or I want to use uh, what Dimeric, now I think they call it 240FC now, um, or I want to use uh, um, GE Silproof um, or Tremco uh, Spec 4 or Spec 3. Um, we know if these products work and there's ones we want to stay away from because it costs so much to do that work to go out there and install a sealant that's going to fail really quick is kind of tough. And the guys that sell these things, they get paid by the bucket or um, whatever their, their commission is. They're, they want you to buy that product. And they'll tell you how great it is. They don't know shit. They don't do these tests. They do what their boss tells them to do, which is sell buckets of sealant. How long does that then? Like that test, how long before they sell? Oh, within six months. Yeah probably within six weeks. Some of them we couldn't even send them back to the lab to have them. What they do is, is uh, these samples here are, they're on these little screw things. They're, um, uh, they're caulked in a lab. Here's how messed up this is. They're caulked in a lab at 72 degrees, and they're left to cure for 30 days in the lab before they're moved at all. So the C ones that we install, the ones we install today, they're 70 degrees this morning. They'll be 105 this afternoon. 
okay? So they temperature-wise, not just the sealant, but the metal panels, the concrete, they're going to thermally move a whole 30-degree cycle before the end of the day, before they're even cured. These were cured 30 days at the same temperature before they were cycled. If, if they're failing in a controlled environment, what do you think they're doing out on the job? Because if you, and, and what, we, what we also found is most of those, they compression set. So if you smash that sealant before it's cured, it retards the growth of the sealant. So let's say that you install that sealant and it's a quarter inch thick and a half inch wide. If you smash it before it's cured, now it's a quarter inch thick, I mean it's a quarter inch wide and a half inch thick, okay? Now you're trying to stretch it out again, when it moves, it won't because it's too thick, it's the wrong profile, and you'll see the sealant actually compression set. Most of these sealants here have a ridge in the middle where they compression set and they weren't extended or compressed for 30 days. So um, sealants are going to perform really, really crappy anyway. You want to pick the best sealant possible and the best joint configuration because you're not dealing with uh, uh, straight shooters on the manufacturer side. And then you said when they suggest to use something that we know is bad, what do we do? Um, we tell them that, that it's not good, we don't recommend it, or we tell them we're not going to warranty it. You get your manufacturer's warranty. Have you, have you shown that, that have you had manufacturers that are really Um. Yes. By Patrick. Patrick says, well, you should try our NP100. It's a better <laughs> <laughs> Try our new stuff, or we've reformulated. Or uh, some people have said, I don't believe the test. I think that you guys did the test wrong. The faulty test. Yeah. yeah, the faulty test. Even though they don't know shit. They weren't there. They didn't. So, how do you know it's done wrong? It must have been. <laughs> the scientists and the chemists that developed the dial guy from Michigan, who we send the test to, said that the conditions that they're testing in the lab is so so close to what we're doing in the field. You know, like from the result standpoint, like the, the, the result that you would do is you did this in the field while it's moving. Um, it's so it's so close together that it doesn't really matter if you do it in the field or you do it in a lab. Yeah. So well, he's proven it. That's all he does. That's all he does is make samples for people and, and test these things years and years and years. But any any questions from out there in the affiliates? None. Hello, Dad. Yes. This is Manish. Yes. I uh, just wanted to ask about the uh, production, you know. Um, a guy can, well, it, de it depends on how thick it is. And, uh, um, a normal sealant, you don't have to use a chisel with. If you can cut it out and it's still soft and it's not wet and gooey, but it's rubbery. It's a solid rubber that's about a half inch thick or less. You can cut out about 200 feet to 250 feet a day, and you can recalk about uh, 150. Now, if you've got to do a bunch of grinding, or if you're wet glazing, uh, I think uh, wet glazing we've been doing about 125 a day, and um, cut out and recalk. We uh, and, and normally what we like to do is we like to remove and replace the same day, so you don't leave a bunch of open joints in case it rains. So I think we normally use about 100. Turkey. Yes. Yeah. 100 cut out and recalk in one day. Or 200 of each. Mm -hmm. I like to put them on a, the same line item because that way you, you remove it, you replace it. Any other questions? Niles? Uh, one, does your thing shadow? Will the urethane shadow? It can, um, if it's manufactured wrong or installed or mixed wrong. But typically it does not. Okay. And for the building that you did in Albuquerque, where you used the Band-Aid and it all failed, what did, what did you do there? Is, at that point, is it just a structural problem and they got to fix it structurally? Or what did you do with the, with the building in Albuquerque? The one you talked about where the... The Band-Aid. The Band-Aid. Oh, okay. What did you do there? Um, I don't recall. What we did is we put the, uh, the movement gauges on it, told the owner, hey, 
you know, you're in, in one 24-hour period because the it was the design of the panel where it um, uh, the joints were too far apart and the panels were too long on the sun facing elevation and it would heat up and they were restrained it part of it was the connections the the panels were restrained at the top of the bottom in such a manner that when the panel grew when it got hot and it shrinks when it gets cold so the panel bowed out in the middle and it took that building base joint and split it that's what it was um, I forget what we did. I think we used a strip, uh, a strip seal. We could not use the silicone. We used, uh, I think Sika has a product called CombiFlex that we might have used. Hey, Dan? Yes. Yeah, that's exactly what we used was the CombiFlex. Okay. I'm glad my memory's still working. I was kind of wondering. But yeah, that's a silicone. That's not a silicone strip seal sure thing or something. It might be hypoline. Any other questions? There were any issues with that recess joint, the rain clean joint, the backer rod not being tight enough, sliding on you when you're tooling on the backup joint. Um, not if you do it right. You just got that. You know, you have to have. It's got to have the right compression. And you have to think about the trick, the, the tough part about doing um, rain screen joints is caulking that back joint and not getting silicone sealant smeared all over the faces of the panel uh, on the joint face. Because you put the first one in, and then if you get shit all over the place, then it's, it's in the way of the second joint. And so you're trying to put back a rod in on the second joint, and you've already smeared silicone all over that face, and it may not stick. So you have to be careful there. But if you put enough, and, and we've, uh, the other thing with the rain screen joint is sometimes there's not enough room because if it's caulk on the inside or there's something else, some other weird shit, why you can't do it, maybe the, the, the window frame is not deep enough to accept an interior joint sealant and then two on the outside. So you're trying to figure out how do I get all this to fit in there. And, of course, the wider it is, the bigger the back of rod is that goes in there that gets compressed. So if you don't have enough room in there, then you're trying to smash everything together. Um, it's nice if you have an airspace in the middle there so you can caulk both at the same time. Because um, then you do you do one in the morning and one in the afternoon so you're not having to re-rig and move the stage over, wait seven days for it to cure up before you caulk over it. So there's a, a couple things. I think since we're talking about cut out re the lessons learned part of it, the parking lots we've had to replace because there's been AC20 used to hold, you know, joints that couldn't have the right size backing in. Right. Like people would, would use AC20 to choke off the side where you had a disc strip, you have a little gap next to the disc strip. They'd be using AC20 to fill that in and try to put their relief tape or flat backer on over it so that they, when they put the sealant in and tool it or self-leveling sealant, it didn't go down inside the crack in the joint. I like your contending a shit out of a lot of joints and had to cut out tens of thousands of feet. That's a, uh, using, using latex to line a joint so that you don't, so the self-leveling sealant doesn't go near the expansion board is a bullshit way we should, shouldn't be doing that. What you should do is if the, if the expansion board's not down low enough, then either hit it with a hammer, saw it out, get the general contractor to remove it, do something to remove that, or you could use release tape, but I would use um, a, a 45 SSL type product or a 50-50 mix of slope grade and self-leveling because it'll choke itself off after minor leakage. If you just put self-leveling in it, it'll all run out. But if you use self-leveling with slope grade, or you can put all slope grade in and tool it, but that's a little harder to do. That's an extra step. So I like the 50-50 mix on that. We haven't seen it in a while, but when we do, we... Oh, we yeah, we saw it at, at Granbury last month. Another thing to think about when you're bidding these type of jobs, if you're not doing a high rise and you're working off of a scaffold, these consultants are getting paid to go back and do tests. So if you're rating a swing stage on a four-story building, you're going to be done with that drop before it cures. So you're going to have to go back and re-rig that drop. Yep. So there's a lot of those kind of things. And, and you know, rigging, it, you know, access. yeah, access is a, is a big deal. Um, how much can you get in a day? And then you think, what if I'm wrong about, you know, because 
you're bidding a building and you can't get up there and cut out and recalc all that shit. So you really can't do a sample unless you put a rig on it. So you have to base it on something and say, I'm basing it on this being the condition. Um, so you got to kind of look at that. Well, just like uh, Jenna's been a job in, in Austin, that a certain portion of the sealant is contaminated with PCBs and asbestos. They've got testing to show it's hot. Well, is that the window perimeters, the precast, the precast, or both? Or does that also uh, happen at the building base and the granite panels? You know, so you ask those kind of questions because th that means somebody has to go. We're not going to abate that. We're not licensed or, uh, or rate, we're not we're not set up to do um, uh, PCB or asbestos abatement. And I think there might be lead in there for all I know. Um, so uh, somebody has to go up there to remove that, and then what do they do? Do they how much do they leave there? Are they leaving? Are they going to take all the residue? Because what if we have to get up there and grind it? Now we're exposed to that. That's airborne. I mean, it's a it's a harder issue when you look at removing and replacing sealants. The kits from Home Depot do PCB, like those little lead test kits, you know, and you can break it and put the liquid on there if it goes red, lead. I wonder if they have those for PCB. I do not know, but fortunately, uh, it's not part of our deal. Uh, and they they uh, they did a full survey on the building and paid for it. It's a federal building, so tax dollars at work. But uh, you don't you know you don't know on a building when you get out there. Hey, when was this thing born? Uh, when was this thing built? And what did you use? And um, you know you just want to consider that. The other thing is you get there these conditions. It looks like a joint, and uh, because there's so much sealant smeared all over. What if that behind that big three quarter inch wide one inch wide joint? It's actually just a bunch of sealant smeared over two joints, and so you think it's you think it's a window frame to a precast panel, but it's not. It's a window frame to flashing flashing precast panel. So now you have to cut out and recall two joints. So there's all kinds of little issues that you you have to consider. Um, it shouldn't go cheap. I know that, but if you don't know anything, what happens? Guys get in trouble when they bid them. And they, uh, most of the companies I've seen uh, uh, smear it. They they just skim over it. It's like that is such bullshit. You know? Yeah, you can make money skimming over shit, but it's not going to work, and it's not right. Any other questions? I hope that helps. That's all I got. <laughs>